Hi everybody and welcome back to episode 29 of our terminal ballistic testing, hunting versus match bullets. Welcome back everybody. Can't believe we're at episode 29 already. So this is pretty crazy. We're revisiting the core locks. Now there's been a lot of changes to the channel. Um, I got a new editing software, got a couple new cameras, lighting, etc. Microphone. So we're getting even better quality for the gel test, the new GoPro 10. Instead of running, you know, 1080p high definition for slow motion, these new 10s are running 2.7K ultra high definition. So we're getting better quality videos. Um, and I'm just excited to keep moving forward. I can't believe we're already at 29 episodes of this. Now this introduction is going to be a little bit different than normal because normally I dive through and have kind of a certain format, but this is very critical. So I want to talk about terminal ballistics real quick. So going forward, everybody can really understand what's going on. Now we have two types of cavities. You have your permanent wound cavity and your temporary wound cavity. Now I'm going to cover the temporary wound cavity first, your hydraulic shock and hydrostatic shock, and then we'll go to the permanent wound cavity. Now with hydrostatic shock, basically what happens is you're having a displacement. When a bullet impacts a water-based mammal like a deer, elk, etc., what's happening is there is a displacement because there's that water, there's elasticity. It's kind of like if you drop something in the water, you're going to see a displacement and then it's going to collapse back. And that's essentially what's happening. Now, with hydrostatic shock, if you're under 2200 feet per second or over 2200 feet per second, Without proper performance, what's going to happen is you're going to get that temporary wound cavity. It's going to cause stuff to rupture, bruise, etc. And then it's going to collapse back. And what you're left with is the permanent wound cavity. Now, with hydrostatic shock, that permanent wound cavity is going to be around the diameter of the bullet or slightly larger, depending on how it performs. So, you know, your main source of damage as far as just trauma is going to be from the bullet itself that diameter of the bullet. So the wider it gets, the better it's going to be. That energy does help, but it's still within the elasticity threshold of that. Now with hydraulic shock, it's the same temporary wound cavity, it's that same displacement. However, because of the velocity and with performance, What's going to happen is it's stretching beyond the elasticity point of that media. So what's happening is if you take a rubber band and you stretch it in all directions until it explodes, that's effectively what's happening. And so in effect, you're basically taking your temporary wound cavity and turning it into your permanent wound cavity. This is where you're going to see wounding that's going to be significantly larger than the bullet itself. Here's a perfect example right here. You can see that the wounding is significantly larger than the bullet's diameter or its expanded diameter. So you can see there's a big difference. And that trauma is going to translate into that animal dying very, very quickly. Now the permanent wound cavity, we've basically already explained. It's the permanent wound cavity that's left afterwards. What shock you get is going to dictate that in the bullet's performance. Now let's dive into the construction and design of this. Now this is a bullet that's been around a long time. Uh, Core locks were first released in 1939 and they have actually a pretty good following. <sighs> Unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand this. Just because there's a lot of people that use this something doesn't mean that it's good or that it's superior or the best just because of the volume of it. That's like saying that a Geo Metro is better than a Ferrari because more people drive Geo Metros. Well, just like the Corlocks, it's not the same thing. 
More people can afford the Geo Metro than the Ferrari. A Ferrari will spank it all day long. But that's the reason it's used. And that's the same thing. I used to hunt with core locks. I used them in my 3030 and I used them in the 308. Now, in both those cases, my boxes of ammo were $12 to $13. And that was for loaded ammunition. Just think about that. That's one of the cheapest loaded ammunitions that you can buy. And when you get something that cheap, you're not getting the same amount of quality, especially when it comes to jacket thickness and construction. Now, these core locks are two different designs. I'm not going to cover the tipped ones because that's a new one completely designed differently. But what we have is a flat base on the bottom and it's a jacketed lead core bullet and it's chemically bonded. So you have a bonded jacket that's bonded to that core. Now you have the round nose and you have the pointed soft tip. This is a pointed soft tip that we're doing in this test, but essentially they're very, very similar. Now, this is a taper jacket. It's thicker at the base and uh, as it goes forward, it gets thinner. And the core itself is actually, it's lead, but it's a very dense lead. And the reason they went really dense with it is to increase penetration and limit expansion. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing because, again, it can just blow right through if you don't have the necessary impact resistance. And so just the design of a period being a flat base. Now, they do well at short distances, but long distance, not even a chance. And so not only do you have accuracy issues, but you also have low BC, that ballistic coefficient. It's not going to buck the wind and environmental conditions as well. And it's going to bleed energy very, very quickly and velocity. So you're not getting a whole lot of distance. All right, let's dive into the permanent wound cavity. Now, with the original test, we did this at a higher velocity. This gun's pushing these 180 grain core locks out at just under 3000 feet per second. And in order to get that minimum impact velocity, we didn't really have to go very far. Uh, the minimum impact velocity for this type of bullet with the jacket, bonded, etc., is 2200 feet per second. And for this, that ended up being 300 yards. So not a whole lot of distance. Now, due to the design of these, that's quite a feat. The reason being is it's not aerodynamic, they're not very accurate, and so it's not a shot most people are going to be taking, but it just shows that with a 300 Win Mag, you're not really gaining any distance, and shooting past that is really not going to help you. Now, the impact velocity for this shot was 2,224 feet per second, so, I mean, just above the minimum impact velocity for expansion. Now, originally I wasn't going to use shoulders on this. I was just going to use the normal setup of hide, meat, and gel set to that correct depth of penetration. However, I ended up changing my mind last second. The reason being, I wanted to add as much impact resistance as possible to show the lack of performance when you're getting down to those velocities with this type of bullet. So I added the shoulder bone and additional meat in order to get that correct setup. Now, it went through all of that, and this is the permanent wound cavity. Now, the max width, not the whole thing, the max width possible that I could find was only one inch. Now, that's not very impressive. I mean, that's plugging through shoulder bone, that's going through inches of meat, and that's going through ballistic gelatin, and that's all we got. Now let's do a quick comparison here. Uh, the reason why I talked earlier about hydraulic shock and hydrostatic shock now, this is an ELD match. It was at 1370 feet per second, uh, which the ELD match has between 1400 and 1300 feet per second minimum impact velocity, depending on the impact resistance and depth of penetration required. So on impact resistant animals that are higher, you're gonna be able to get that 1300. Lower, you're gonna have to go up to 1400. But the important part of this is that permanent wound cavity had a max width of one and one eighth inch. So it was an eighth of an inch larger than what we got with the core locks at over 2,200 feet per second. Now, why this is so interesting and important to show difference in performance, we have one that's just under 1,400 feet per second, one that's just over 2,200 feet per second, 
but the core locks are still within the threshold for hydraulic shock to where it's stretching beyond the elasticity and you can get a permanent wound cavity that is larger than the bullet's diameter expanded. Whereas with hydrostatic shock, you don't have that. Your permanent wound cavity is gonna be around the size of that bullet max expansion can sometimes be a little bit larger and micro but the reason it's so important is with bones and everything and the eld match didn't have that it only had hide meat and ballistic gelatin it was able to let's just forget the eighth of an inch and call it equal it was able to achieve the same width of permanent wound cavity and that means that bullet was actually expanding more so it had better expansion, it opened up and caused that cavity, whereas the core locks were in that threshold of hydraulic shock to where that wider cavity is caused by that bullet's transition of energy. Now, did it get the full transition? Clearly not. But one is causing by the bullet, that bullet expanding at that lower velocity and causing that massive trauma, even though it's not in hydraulic shock. And the other one's within the hydraulic shock limitations and is getting an eighth of an inch smaller cavity. So that's really not good performance, especially again, we're going through bones here. Another good example is here is A tips at 1800 feet per second. And the max width of this cavity was two inches with, if I remember right, it was one and a half inch average. So the average part of that cavity was one and a half inches and the max was two inches. And that was at 1800 feet per second. So two different projectiles, both under that threshold of the 2200 feet per second that are getting better terminal performance than the core lock in that over 2200 feet per second threshold as far as that permanent wound cavity. Now, if we had done this without the extra meat and bones, you're going to get a smaller permanent wound cavity and less transition of energy. And so that bullet is going to barely deform and you're not going to, you're probably going to cut that temporary wound cavity in half. Now let's talk about the temporary wound cavity here, that hydraulic shock and hydrostatic that we've talked about. Now we've already looked at the permanent wound cavity, not really what I would call ideal results or even good performance, but again, we're getting down towards that minimum impact velocity. If anybody is going to take a shot like this, I don't recommend you do with this bullet, but if you did, I recommend going for a high shoulder just to increase that impact resistance. But let's watch the video real quick of the slow motion and then we'll talk. Now you can see there's, you know, the bone that's going up. Now it looks like I hit it a little high. That's just simply because the bone I had to raise my point of aim in order to hit the correct part of the bone in order to replicate this shot. So it's really not that high and it's going to show exactly what it does either way, whether it's half an inch lower or not. So nothing crazy there. Um, you know, it's an okay cavity. Uh, what's left after that is nothing that i would call desirable after it's done expanding and dropping down um, this was the best chance it had to replicate going through a shoulder and again you're going to get significantly less if you're not going through a shoulder or hitting bones the potential energy dump was 1978 foot pounds of energy which it clearly did not achieve uh, that's something a lot of people don't understand Energy, you know, the kinetic energy they talk about, the shock, it's only a potential and it's directly dependent upon that bullet's performance. If that bullet does not perform, you're not getting that energy dump. A prime example was episode four, we did the Barnes triple shock against the ELD match. Now, the Barnes triple shock at over 2200 feet per second had significantly more energy potential, around 2300, I think it was. And the ELD match at 1370 feet per second had a potential energy dump of 700. Now, they had identical temporary wound cavities in size around six inches. So, is that one actually transferring all that, you know, over 2,000 foot pounds of energy? No. In fact, based off that and the smaller wound cavity, it was achieving somewhere between six and 700 foot pounds of energy. So, just because you 
have that in your ballistic calculator doesn't mean you're going to have that amount of energy. It's all dependent on that bullet and how it performs. The more it expands, the more surface contact, the more trauma and transition of energy that you're going to get. And once you start getting down towards minimum impact velocities, you're going to see minimal expansion. So there's going to be more penetration and less trauma. It's not going to open up as much and really dump that energy. Now in conclusion, this is not a good bullet. I, I, I really, I get a lot of slack for saying that, but the evidence speaks louder than anything. And that's the way I like to stick it. I tell everybody I'm not sponsored. I don't accept sponsors, quick pro quo, etc. You know, I don't have people send me stuff just to, you know, give it a good review and spin it out. I'm just gonna give it exactly what it deserves. Core locks are cheap, uh, they're inconsistent, they're not very accurate, and they're not very good as far as performance. A problem you have with bullets like this with these thicker jackets, when that jacket's being poured, you can actually get inconsistencies. You can get pockets that are going to be lighter. You can get heavier spots. And so that results in increased wobble and less stability. And so when you already have a bullet that's not aerodynamic, you're shooting that, especially if you start stretching out, you're going to not stabilize as well and you're going to end up losing gyroscopic stability. It was about eight years ago, I had a guy that shot a deer on camera and he saw it hit and it looked like it got hit by a truck and he's like, oh, well, it should have done it. And it was great performance, but I don't, I don't know why I never recovered the animal. And watching it, I knew exactly what happened. What had happened was, is he was way below, one, the minimum impact velocity, and two, that bullet had lost gyroscopic stability. And when it impacted, it impacted not true and ended up hitting and basically hitting sideways. And so what happened with that is... Basically, it hit and went in very shallow. Now, did it cause damage to the ribs and everything? Oh, yes. But it ultimately didn't do anything because it's not going to penetrate. It's not going to expand. It sometimes will bend a little. I've seen you know animals recover with bullets like that to where it looks bent. And it's not ideal results. Now, to prove this to him, we actually went out with the remainder of his bullets. He had a couple hundred and we shot at the same distance at four and 500 yards and out of 200 rounds, every single one of them lost gyroscopic stability and impacted sideways. We had some of those thin metal signs we set out and 200 rounds, every single one of them at that point out of a 308 had lost gyroscopic stability. So it's not something you wanna stretch out at any shape or form. 300, you know, for this is not, I would not want to take it any further than that, even for testing one, because it's going to be below the minimum impact velocity and it's just not going to be accurate. And even at 300, the accuracy wasn't exactly stellar and that's coming out of a custom rifle. So not only does the minimum impact velocity drastically limit your range, the design does, but you can have a lot of inconsistencies. There's not the same kind of quality control and you know best materials used. So it's, it's just not going to give you perf the type of performance that you want. Now, can you kill with them? Yes. Any bullet will kill. That's irrelevant. It's how well they perform. So, you know, a, a lot of people try to tell me, oh, well, dead is dead. An animal doesn't know the difference. I beg the differ. I'll tell you what. Here's a perfect example. And anybody who denies this has got their head up their ass. That animal is in significant pain when it gets shot. So there's a big difference between it surviving for one second or 20 seconds. Now, 20 seconds doesn't seem that long. Well, if you take a cattle prod and get zapped for a second and then get zapped for 20 seconds, that 20 seconds is going to drag on and is going to suck. And that's what people don't understand because when that animal gets shot, you want an instantaneous death, whether it's from shot placement or bullet performance or both. You want that animal to die as quickly as possible. And people say, oh, well, it only ran 40 yards, stood there for a few seconds and dropped. Well, yeah, but the entire time that it did that, that was suffering and in pain from being shot. So will they all kill? Yes, but it's how effective they are. And when we're hunting, ethics is about a quick, clean kill. So, you know, I'm going for the absolute most trauma I can to put that animal down as quickly as possible because that's what I owe these animals. They're giving their lives so that we can eat and enjoy that food. So I'm going to do my part in order to give 
the best terminal performance possible to make sure that animal suffers as minimal as possible. Now, just to even emphasize the difference, you know, I showed the ballistic gel difference as far as the terminal performance, but just to show like this is at 645 yards. This was a couple years ago um, up in Tennessee. That's a 168 grain ELD match out of a 308. And you can see that exit hole. So, I mean, if you look at that exit hole size versus, you know, that 1370. Now, was it difference as far as impact velocity? But it shows that it's opening up and really doing that, even at the lower velocities. Now, that was at 1,651 feet per second impact velocity with a potential energy dump of 1,017. Now, it died right on the spot. It had perfect terminal performance. Chest cavity was just mush. It had just, I mean, it was sloshing around inside. So really gave good performance. My son ended up shooting this one at 630 yards. And again, the same thing. And we're talking just a couple hundred feet per second over what we did that test at. And so it shows that not only does the gel show what the type of performance we're going to get, but it's mirrored in the field. And so, you know, we killed four deer. I killed three in 40 minutes and from 541 yards out to 645 yards. And he killed the one at 630 yards, all with that same gun. And so, you know, good bullets is what matters. All those animals, except one dropped on the spot and it only went, you know, 10 feet. And that was, I mean, that was run keel over it's dead so there was no suffering on the part of these animals they went down quickly and that's what you want so i mean 300 yards is not that far to people who don't really shoot a lot or know about it that might seem long but in reality especially in the long range world 300 yards is is close range and so when you're already limiting not only your accuracy and consistency but your terminal performance with this it's not something i recommend um, if people want to use it, they can. I've seen poor results on animals for years with them. Um, I ended up going away from them. And, you know, after years and years of hunting and, you know, diving in and learning terminal ballistics and bullets and where I'm at now, it's just, it's a terrible bullet. I really don't understand the people that are fans of it and think that it's this incredible thing, especially with overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Now, we've got several new bullets coming in the mail. Uh, thank you to a buddy of mine, Jared, who is sending me those. I really appreciate it. Now, I, I'm, I've talked about it a lot. I'm not sponsored. I don't do any of that. Occasionally, I'll have buddies send me stuff to test, and you know I'll do that, but I'm not associated with anybody. It's not coming from a company. It's all just fair, honest reviews with no bias. I don't, you know, I'm not doing it to get people to send me stuff or anything like that. These are just buddies helping out. So Jared, I appreciate it. Also got to give a shout out to my buddy, Paul, um, you know, sending me some shoulders and stuff that they found while out there, you know, hunting and doing their filming. So I have bones from them. And then I also have bones that I took from my deer from last year and hides and stuff to keep doing this. And as we continue, I'm going to start adding, we're going to be revisiting certain projectiles and adding bones in there to replicate high shoulder. So you're seeing the difference between, you know, shot with just hide, meat, and gel, and then adding bones in there like we did with this. So we have a lot more coming. This has been an incredible ride. Thank you to all those people who've been there. Uh, the people that have helped me out with advice or sending, you know, bullets, those friends who have done that. Um, even had one buddy send me some ballistic gel, which was a huge help because I fund all this by myself and I don't make anything off of it. So, you know, those little bits and pieces have helped. And thank you to everybody who's just supported me, uh, been there, you know, saying, hey, you know, great job. I want to see this. I want to see that. Can you do this? Um, and we're going to keep plugging away. It's, it's honestly been a very interesting ride for somebody like myself who never planned on doing YouTube. This whole thing started because I got a ton of requests from people to do it. They wanted good factual information without the bias and sponsors and all that. And so here we are. Never thought I would enjoy it, but it's actually a lot of fun and I enjoy helping people. So we're going to continue diving in. We got a lot of, you know, coming up, a lot of good videos. I'm even revisiting some of the old videos now that I have better software and cameras and everything and, you know, more documentation of animals, etc. And I'm going to start redoing those videos so it's better quality for everybody and revisiting, especially those common topics that 
you know, get the most views and I really want to increase the quality of that to match the content. So everybody, I really appreciate you tuning into this episode. Everybody be safe out there. Happy hunting. Hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and turn on notification bell so you won't miss out on any future video. And happy hunting!